All right, we're going to get started here. I'd just like to start by uh, saying thank you again to Mr. Ross, Mr. Bowman, and Mr. Tirico for that great conversation. Uh, if we could get another round of applause for them, that'd be great. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Hancock, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Michigan Sport Business Conference. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, hopefully, you guys have enjoyed our many impressive panelists so far. Uh, I can promise you our next uh, speaker is going to be just as impressive as the previous ones. Um, Michigan man Rohan Oza earned his MBA from right here in the Stephen M. Ross School of Business. After beginning his career as the youngest manager to run Mars m and Snicker brand in Europe, Rohan became the, began to become involved in the beverage industry by aiding Sprite's rise before moving on to revitalize the Powerade brand. Rohan's innovative advertising campaigns and partnerships with athletes that helped lead to brand three straight years of brand growth. After revitalizing the brand, Rohan moved on to the little known at the time, Glaso uh, Drink Company, where he joined the vitamin water and helped bring it into the force that it is today. Through creative advertising with celebrities like Jennifer Aniston, Alicia Keys, and superstar athletes like LeBron James and our very own Tom Brady, vitamin water began its meteoric rise. Since then, Rohan has gone on to start his own, com uh, his own company, Idea Merchants Capital, where his latest projects include Pop Chips, Vita Coco, which are two of the most fastest growing brands in their respective markets today. Rohan's presentation on creative disruption and uh, use, the use of strategic celebrities to build iconic brands promises to be a very impressive presentation. Without any further ado, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Rohan Oza. Okay, I, am I on? No? Yeah, I'm good. I walk a lot. Um, good afternoon, how's everyone doing? That is bloody pathetic. I'm just checking. Michigan Business School, University of Michigan, the best school in the Big Ten, one of the best universities in the country. Let's try it one more time. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? All right. Thought $100 million made you guys weak. Okay. Well, um, look, thanks, thanks for having me back here. You know, I, I graduated just like two years ago. Um, and, and it's the Indian skin is deceptive. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I, was, I thought I was going up after Ira and Dave Schwab, which is a great act to go up after because they suck. But, it, but in fact, you guys put me up against one of the best announcers on television, the guy you know, basically who built this house, the Babe Ruth of Michigan, and the guy running MLB. So really, it's a tough act to follow. So I've got a lot of videos. That's just going to keep it going. Um, I, I mean, I'm amazed. I mean, I, when I went here, this place was like prehistoric. The, the building you guys have here and the technology is phenomenal. I mean, there's only a few things that haven't changed. I think, you know, scorekeepers, Ricks, and ZBT pretty much haven't changed in 25 years. <laughs> but, but, I mean, ZBT, good Lord. <laughs> but Glout did well enough to go actually donate money for this auditorium. We've got to give him props on that. Um, I'm here to talk about creative disruption. What the hell does that have to do with sports business? It doesn't. It's just the only presentation I had in my file. So, as, as uh, Dan Rebell said, it's a repeat. Um, what, what I've done, what I've been lucky to be a part of, is building some amazing lifestyle brands that are better for you. Whether it's Vitamin Water, Smart Water, Pop Chips, Vita Coca, the Coconut Water, or even Flywheel, the hottest spinning sensation in the country. Uh, all these brands are products that people are looking for. But the entrepreneurs at the time really set a vision and built these brands from them. And if you're going up against the big guys, you're going up against Coke, Pepsi, Kraft, Unilever, you don't have the money, you don't have the manpower. What you have to have is creative ideas and disrupt the flow of what's happening out there. If you want to build a brand and you're an entrepreneur, have some creative disruption. And I've used uh, musicians, I've used entertainers, and most importantly for this conference, I've used athletes a lot to help build these brands. And so that's part of the story is, how do we create brands in the first part of the presentation, and then how have I leveraged athletes creatively in terms of helping to build those brands? So let's go. The first thing is, what's happening in America today that's really allowing me to do what I do and why this is pretty much the greatest country on earth in terms of building a new company. It's because everyone wants to be healthier. Everyone wants products that are better for them, that taste better, that do more. We're not satisfied with, you know, 
eating Big Mac and fries four days a week and putting on 50 pounds. I don't think anybody's saying, oh, I love that. I'm going to be cool today. No, it's, it, they want products that are better for them. Everybody's looking for that. It's a big part of what people are looking for. But in this country, and it's the right thing, we never compromise on taste. If the product doesn't taste good, it's not happening. So here's an example. Everyone loves chips. I love fried chips. They're great. It's got a lot of fat, very greasy. You finish the bag after your sandwich lunch. You wipe your pants, and it looks nasty. So they created baked chips. Well, baked were terrible. Who's going to eat baked? Tastes like cardboard. So pop chips came out. I said, oh, we'll make some chips that taste great, half the fat, a third less calories. And by the way, these things taste great. So suddenly, you've got a brand that's now what people are looking for, starting to break through, because they're looking for a healthier product. Gatorade, unbelievable product. Gatorade came out 40 years ago. I don't know if you guys watch ESPN Classic. Um, Bob actually was uh, part of creating it 40 years ago. Um, and he, 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 ESPN Classic, you may remember uh, Joe Namath wearing a fur coat, drinking coffee on the sidelines, smoking a cigarette. They didn't know about hydration, and this, you know, it's just about looking cool at the game. Gatorade came out, created a product that really did something functionally. But for 40 years, nothing happened innovation-wise. And then Vitamin Water came out. And we said, you know what? For the top 1% of athletes, you do need that Gatorade probably because you're going to need that sodium for the game. For the 99% of the population, you're short on vitamins. You're not short on sodium. I'm sure you guys, after your pizza lunch today, were pretty much loaded up on sodium for the day, maybe even the week. Vitamin Water came out, delivered a product people wanted. Vita Coco, coconut water. Darren Ravel said, we wrote said niche product. This is never going to be big. Several hundred million dollars later, Darren could be wrong. Uh, <laughs> Could be wrong. He's waiting for the billion dollar mark before, you know, before I win the bet. But why did, why did Vitacoco explode? Well, because people wanted a sports drink, but in the war of man versus nature, guess what? Nature's undefeated. Coconut water is nature's sports drink. Three times the electrolytes gives you back at a lower calorie level what Gatorade gives you, but it does it with potassium. People want more from their products. So something that was niche five years ago and now is an entire category is worth over half a billion dollars and growing rapidly is because people want more for them. I spoke to someone about yoga. Yoga was just cruising along, nice and steady. Danone was the leader. You had Stony Field, nothing too exciting out there. And then suddenly the Greek yogurts exploded. And what did they, why? Why did Greek yogurt suddenly explode? Well, because they dropped the carbohydrates, they dropped the sugar, and they loaded up the protein. Women jump on it first, because women are generally smarter, they get the stuff first. Guys come on a little later, we love it, but we stick with it. And, so, and then they've gone on to the next product. So, in terms of Chobani, they come in, it's a billion dollar brand. Why? Because they give you protein. It gives you more. People want products that do more for them. And that's why the brand's blown up and redef redefined the yogurt category. And it's happening in apparel as well. Nike is the lead, is the giant, which does incredibly well. Adidas does well. But suddenly, 10 years ago, a brand that no one had heard of because it didn't exist is now worth over $4 billion in Under Armour because they started with functional superiority. They had a better product for them. People like Ray Lewis, now Tom Brady, wore these things as their Under Armour when they played sports. It started there, they expanded their product line, and through functional superiority, these guys built the brand. And all these brands now, Chobani, you'd never heard of before, suddenly five, five years later is now the official sponsor of the Olympics. All these brands are using athletes in a big way because athletes have a much stronger voice than ever before. Social media has given them that platform. Yes, we can use them in advertising commercials, but social media now gives you that platform to take you to the next level. So how do you create a phenomenon? Well, I've been lucky enough to do it with Smart Water with Jennifer Aniston or Vitamin Water with 50 Cent and Brian Erlacher and LeBron James and, you know, so on and so forth. But when you know you have a brand that's a phenomenon, it's when the brand has become part of pop culture. You see it on TV. You see it in the movies. You see it in trash cans all over the country. It's one of the most indicative ways to realize that a brand has started to break through in New York City is you start seeing it on the street and in trash cans. You start seeing it in people's fridges. There's a buzz around the brand. That's when brands have broken through. That's when you're part of a phenomenon. That's when you've broken through and become part of pop culture in America. And that's the toughest thing to do. But once you do that, you're a brand that's here to stay. So how does that happen? A lot of guys in this room here want to be entrepreneurs, I'm sure. Everybody here now wants to become Mark Zuckerberg. Everyone wants to be a billionaire. So how do you get there? Well, you've got to start with an original idea. I think I'm fairly smart, but I've actually never had an original idea. 
I know a lot of guys who have, though, and I'm, I'm smart enough to jump on board with really smart entrepreneurs in terms of guys who found that original idea. But when you have that original idea and you're different, guess what happens? Everyone says 50 reasons or gives you 50 reasons why that product won't work because it's not on the market. It hasn't been around. So every expert or talking head says, ah, fight and water. That's niche. That's not going to be, that's not going to be big. Guess what? Every brand is niche until it's not. I bet you Facebook was niche on Harvard's campus seven, eight years ago, and now it's not so much. Vitamin Water is not so niche. Neither is Gatorade. Brands that started and create categories and bring something new are all niche until they're not. So you have to defy the experts, but also become a student of the industry. Know your industry. Most entrepreneurs who start companies haven't done it. The guy who started, Phil Knight didn't start four companies like Nike before Nike. They pretty much start the company they start and build it an amazing brand, but they also become students of the industry because they're all new to it. And the way to have winning ingredients is to have the right people, the right product, with the right personality. If you have great products, not great people, it's not going to get out there, and vice versa. Bring those three things together, but do it in a way that's different. Don't go out there and try and retread what everyone else has been doing because you won't make it far. Be different. I mean, don't be an ass, but be different. <laughs> so you've got, you've got the sort of foundations. Want to be an entrepreneur, have the original idea, defy the experts. But how do you create that culture? And for me, there's three brand mantras. We had these at Vitamin Water that were sort of the foundation piece. One was live the brand. Be a brand messiah. Don't be a brand manager. I know a lot of you guys want to be brand marketers, but have a passion for your product. Have a passion for your product. Don't be like the dude I met who was the brand manager on Tampax. The dude I met. Um, <laughs> Mind-boggling. The, the way that, the way, the way that, <laughs> where did he put it? The way, that, the, the way that we would take our products and take them everywhere we went, we were brand messiahs. I remember I'd, every time I'd leave the office to travel, I'd get a cooler bag, 10 bottles of vitamin water, I'd give it to everyone from the person who checked me in right all the way to the flight attendants. Then some idiot put a bomb in his shoe, blew his left nut off, and I can't take any liquids for security now. <laughs> I'm, I'm frankly lucky if I get through without getting frisked these days, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> Be a brand messiah, don't be a brand manager or a brand marketer. Influence the influencers. These are obvious influencers. You know, Alex Rodriguez is a big fan of Vita Coco. David Ortiz is a big fan of uh, Pop Chips. Alex obviously is a great guy. I mean, up until the World Series, pretty much. But, but before that, fantastic for the brand. But these are obvious influencers. But in this room, you've got a bunch of influencers. You've got the person sitting next to you. The guy or the girl might be the most popular person on campus. They may have 2,000 Facebook fans. They might be active on Twitter. Dan Ravel is an influencer. Wouldn't believe it, but he is. Um, and it's people like that, the one in 10 Americans who influence the other nine. The one in 10 Americans who influence the other. That's the gang you need to get to. That's where athletes come into play. They influence people nationally and in local markets. And finally, it's a terrible picture, but people are drunk there. Create the right culture. When you get into a company, a lot of CPG companies try and do this pretty well. Not everyone does. Who does it well is Silicon Valley. The Googles, the Facebooks, the Airbnbs, these startup entrepreneurial companies create this work hard, play hard culture. Dorico talked about working hard. You have to bust your ass to do well. But if you've got to create a culture that when you work hard, you don't have fun, everyone's leaving. You've got to have both ends and create that culture. And if you put all those three things together and you believe, you get results. I remember the CEO of Vitamin Water, the founder, said to me, when the company's doing $50 million, he told them, we're going to be the next billion dollar brand. I thought the guy was crazy. He had to be smoking dope. At $50 million, you think you're the next billion dollar brand. He realized that we were all wrong and he was a visionary. Because he set that benchmark. He set the billion dollar mark. And when he said it, everyone said, you know what? Maybe. Maybe we can do this. And suddenly he set the top of the mountain and we followed him to it. Vitamin Water got to a billion dollars, sold for four billion dollars, and the rest is history. So how do you create? So I've given you sort of the foundation of what you need to do. How do you start the brand energy? How do you create the brand mantras? But how do we do it in some of the brands that I've been involved in? Well, 
I'll tell you a few stories. One, the real 50 cent story. Everyone wants to know that. I'll give you the story. I can't give the exact numbers because I have a deal. I don't give the exact numbers and 50 doesn't shoot me. I think it's pretty fair. <laughs> pretty, pretty fair deal. <laughs> Creatively leveraging athletes. How do we do athlete programming? How do we do PR? How do we do social media in a different way? And finally, athletes and owners. Everyone wants to have skin in the game. Everyone wants to have equity now. Vitamin Water is one of the first brands that did it on, on a fairly big scale. So the 50 cent story. When, when I got to Vitamin Water, we, we had a great brand, great packaging. It was a medicinal product. It was cool in certain parts of New York City. It was pretty boring everywhere else. And so I needed to sort of, you know, create that disruption. And if you picked someone who was expected, there would have been no disruption. There would have been no buzz. When you pick a rapper who's been shot nine times and fuse it with a product that looks like a medicinal bottle of vitamins, you get creative disruption. It was one of the biggest PR campaigns of all time. And what we did was we made 50 an owner in the company. And the buzz went out that 50 was the owner of Vitamin Water. And it's actually funny that the first time the actual founder of Vitamin Water met 50 said, he's like, good to meet you. My name is Darius. I am the owner of Vitamin Water. <laughs> Um, and you know, 50 was great though, because he became an owner in the company, he took it to the next level. He put the PR out there, he created his own formula. Every time he went somewhere, he had the product with him. And when the numbers went out on what 50 finally made, it changed the game. But what allowed 50 to do is do things differently with us. Uh, we'll run that commercial we have with 50. A bad first glitch. Welcome to a televised performance of the National Symphony. We'll be hearing Beethoven's Ninth, and the conductor, Shimizu Matsuka, will be replaced by a relative newcomer, Curtis Jackson, also known as the rapper, 50 Cent. He says he's always loved the work of Beethoven, and often thinks of him as a true OG. Kept so busy by his recording career, it hasn't felt up to trying this. And since he began drinking vitamin water Formula 50, he feels he's up to the task. One more change, this one for the first viola chair. DJ Who Kid. <laughs> Sounds like he's integrated his hit into club. Extraordinary. And now he's calling out the trombonist for a solo, which is great because they've been rumored to have beat before the show. Wait a minute, I want to try it. So, you know, whatever we, we could have done 50, lifting weights, working out, drinking a vitamin water afterwards, it wouldn't have got the play. When you do something like this, it starts getting the play. So what happens, once we did the 50 deal, you guys hear me clearly in this thing? Or? Okay. Well, once we did the 50 deal and the numbers went out and what 50 and some of the other athletes made, everybody wanted equity. It changed the game with athletes. Everyone wants skin in the game because athletes realize now, you know, one second, I'm going to build this brand. So I want that endorsement check, sure, but I want equity in the company and the brands I'm going to build. And that's where the game started changing. So all these athletes now have skin in these companies because that's what's different. And when that happens you get athletes acting very differently. And I'll give you an example of what I call hat gate. So Brian Erlacher didn't take cash. He took equity in Biden Water. He was a very smart guy. And we decided one year, the, the Bears went to the Super Bowl. And uh, Brian, I said, Brian, why don't you wear, the president of the company actually had this idea. And Mike said, Brian, we need you to wear a Biden Water hat. And I said, Mike, what's the point? It's covered on the NFL Network. This is five, six years ago. About seven guys are watching game day. I mean, for the CBS, something like that, on the main show, different story, but who's watching, you know, the sort of the pregame game game day? It's like 12 people. Anyway, doesn't matter. Brian wore the hat. About 15 seconds into Brian wearing the hat, a phone call must have gone up from Chicago with a sports drink company that's uh, fairly large to the NFL and said, what the heck? We're the sponsor. We're on the sidelines. Why are those guys wearing it? So some dude comes scurrying down and says, Mr. Erlacher, please, you have to take your hat off. And he's a big dude, but Brian's a nice guy. Took his hat off. Now, Brian knew he shouldn't be wearing that hat, but because he was a part of the company, because he was an owner in the company, he said, to hell with it. I'll put the hat on. So, you know what? We gave a bunch of money to charity. We thought it was a good way. We gave like 50, what is his number, 54? We gave like 54 grand to charity, just as a nice way. He wore the hat. And I thought, you know what? That was the end of it. It was a good try. Forget about it. 
But Gatorade was pretty upset, so NFL decided uh, to send Brian a fine. Now, Brian doesn't check his locker too often, frankly, but he went in there a month after he got this fine. Now, there's some guys in sports who probably, you know, have longer rap sheets. Brian like a pretty nice guy. This guy got a $100,000 fine for wearing a hat. $100,000. So now big corporations would have said, oh my God, Brian got fined. Let's just pay the fine, sweep it under the rug, and call it a day. Not us, no. We said, all right, we're going to pay your fine, Brian. Well, first we said we weren't, then he sort of came through the phone at us, and then we said, okay, relax. We just showed, <laughs> got like six foot seven in like, like a house. So anyway, so, so, so we paid the fine, and then we took the picture of Brian with the hat. And this is how entrepreneurial companies act differently. We took the picture, went to AP, and said, this is crazy. Like, the NFL has rules and regulations, but to find this guy a hundred grand for wearing a hat for 45 seconds, 15 seconds or 40 seconds is crazy. That story got picked up everywhere. We went from zero coverage to $10 million worth of media coverage on every network out there. And Brian did that because he was an owner of the company. Brian did that because, you know what? He's part of the company culture. It wasn't just an endorsement. So let's take a look at the, um, at the coverage we got. There's one back to Brian Furlock for final hundred thousand dollars for the NFL for drinking vitamin water and wearing a vitamin water hat during a Super Bowl media session. Partner of the one Mike Wolf on Tony Rogers and they'll find Brian Furlocker for wearing a vitamin water cap, but he can't find me. <laughs> So, I mean, that went off across the country. And because Brian was part of it, the coverage was insane. And we got way more money than we put into it. And to actually add, um, to add insult to injury, we paid Brian's fine. And when the NFL got upset with us, we gave $100,000 to the United Way, their charity. So they were like, OK, it's all good now. And there was only one guy who was upset. And we won't talk about them. Um, so when athletes start to become involved, it becomes a lot more engaging to them. Now, you know, most of the time, you know, we've got some agents in the room, Ira, etc. You know, usually I've got to call Ira to get him, get him, get one of his celebrities to do something. You've got to go through Ira, you've got to find time, the athlete doesn't want to do it. It's just a whole, like, palaver. With Shaq, because he had skill in the game, and Shaq is a very smart investor. He's invested in a ton of companies, tech as well as, as, well as um, CPG companies. Shaq's calling me on a Sunday. So I see this unknown number. I'm like, you know, you scared, everyone's getting to become unknown, like crazy X. But no, um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, so Shaq, I think I'm like, hello? He goes, yo, Rob. I'm like, who's this? He goes, yo, Shaq. I'm like, Shaq, how are you doing? He goes, yeah, what are you doing? So I'm just hanging with the family. He goes, okay, good, I got an idea. I'm like, well, what idea? He goes, okay, so imagine, I'm in Miami. Two cars chasing me down. I run to this building, get to the rooftop. These guys shoot me, I miss the bullet, I fly off. I'm like, oh, good God. Sounds like a bad version of Miami Vice. But the good news is Shaq is engaged in the idea. Like, he wants to do it. So I said, fine, fly to New York, we'll meet up with you. So Shaq comes to New York, we we'll meet him. Um, his agent's there, because his agents have to be there. Um, and uh, me and the president of the company go meet him. And uh, at the time, Mike had just started, Mike uh, was president of the company, had just started uh, getting into horse racing. He's now one of the biggest horse racing guys in the country. And we we're talking about Belmont, and, you know, he was having some horses race, and Shaq goes, oh, that's cool, I love horse racing. I could be a jockey. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, that'd be a fun idea. I'm like, really? Suddenly, in, in the space of brainstorming with Shaq for 20 minutes, we come up with an idea for Shaq to be a jockey at the Kentucky Derby. We put together a Super Bowl spot. We ran it four months later on the Super Bowl, and it was ranked one of the top ten spots in USA Today. I mean, that's sort of the creative disruption that occurs when someone's got skin in the game. They want to be creative. They want to be part of the company. Let's take a look at the spot. Hopefully, we have some volume. And so, you know, LeBron James got involved in this. And every, every ad that LeBron James does is LeBron on court, you know, playing basketball, et cetera. So we thought, 
LeBron would do something different. We would take LeBron off the court and into court. So, again, LeBron was involved in the company, engaged creatively. He's a very smart guy. He's an incredible businessman as well as a phenomenal basketball player. And uh, so we got involved, did something fun and creative, and created this spot with, with LeBron on the court or in court, really. Full of vitamin and water energy, LeBron James found the energy to try ruling another court. He's quickly become the most dominant defense attorney in the state of Ohio. These documents show my client had nothing to do with this man falling down the elevator shaft, but I don't need him. Was Nikki versus Oregon proves that we are free from the tyranny of false accusations. Besides, objection! Dude's faking it. I rest my case. <laughs> So the reason these ads now and getting athletes more engaged in creative development is important is because they now have a social media platform that extends the advertising beyond the first screen, as Bob mentioned earlier, into people's lifestyles. So the following they had, you know, LeBron, 12 million fans on Facebook, 6 million on Twitter, Shaq, 6 million on Twitter. These guys have huge reaches. So when you run a campaign and you run ads now, they can take that and expand on it. Tiger Woods, huge numbers. Even Reggie Bush, technically a regional athlete, has 2 million fans on Twitter. So when you have this large base and large audience, you take the creative ads and they have a much greater life cycle beyond just running them on television. So what happened was when Facebook was starting to explode with companies and um, Vitamin Water probably had 25,000 Facebook fans at the time, we said we want to try and up this. And what was happening at the time, if you guys remember, was the whole Kobe LeBron debate. Kobe was on a Lakers team that was actually winning. Um, LeBron was in the Cleveland, which wasn't doing so well other than just him, but he had took them to the finals. And everyone was debating, who's better, Kobe, LeBron? It's game seven, final shot, who takes it? You're starting a new franchise, anchor player, who do you want? Kobe, LeBron. And there was a great debate. ESPN was doing it, CBS Sports Line was doing it. Everyone was talking about it. So we said, you know what? We have these two guys. They're owners in the company. Let's do it differently. So we created this whole thing called The Great Debate, and we took it to Facebook. And we had fans vote on this, and we created an ad around this. And it wasn't just the ad lived much longer because we took it through Facebook. And basically, our fan base went up from 25,000 to a quarter of a million within a week. We actually were the first company to tag the U Facebook URL on the end of the commercial. I really should have done a deal with Zuckerberg for stock at that point. Didn't really realize where that company was going, clearly. But we did that first. No other company had done it. Everyone else followed, and then we ended up becoming one of the hottest brands on Facebook because we were doing this early. Let's just run that, run that ad. Simple ad, teed up the debate, quarter of a million people came in, joined us, and even, even more voted for this. So we built off that, and we're like, okay, well, how do we get more into the social media space? Well, every brand out there tries to create a new flavor, right? New flavor, new package, they run a contest, and most contests don't actually really break through. Like, they run the ads, or they run the promotion, and probably about 500 people actually apply online, because it's, it doesn't really take. With this commercial, because we used Steve Nash, Fuse of 50 Cent, did it the creative way. We actually got over 50,000 people submitting ideas for a new vitamin water flavor, and we took our Facebook numbers from quarter of a million to over a million. We became one of the top four beverage brands online through Facebook, even though our revenues weren't quite there yet. But we were creating disruption. We used Snash, who was a very funny guy and a very creative guy, with 50, created a new flavor, and broke through the barrier. And so if we were doing that with big dollars, it wouldn't have worked. We did it with creativity. We did it by going to Facebook early, and we broke through where most traditional big brands don't. Let's run that. We all remember the old game, vitamins, water, repeat. No thanks. Then we gave you vitamin water and changed the game. All right, let's go. 
I'm Canadian celebrity Steve Nash. That's right. Have you ever wanted to make your own flavor of vitamin oil, but you didn't want to deal with the mess, the stress, the legal ramifications? Do you feel stuck in the past, wishing you had a new futuristic web 2.0 way to get your vitamins? Do you feel like your creativity is being suppressed by the powers that be? Like you just want to bust out and express yourself. Check it. We're going to let you, yeah, I said it, you, design your own vitamin oil. Hi, I'm Curtis Jackson. I used to have to grind to get my fight back. So I made my own flavor of fight back. Now I'm stacking rich. You know, I smell like a bug. And I'm so paid, man. I mean, this dude, nobody knew from no good things. Rich I'm talking about. Man, now you act like you don't even know. Look, people, it's as easy as one, two, three. Step one, go to facebook.com forward slash vitamin. Step two, pick your vitamins and your favorite foods. Step three, Design your body. Step four. Get paid. <laughs> Why are we doing this? Are we crazy? Maybe. <laughs> So why did Steve do that? Again, Steve was part of the company, 50 years he was already in, took on numbers through the roof. And I think what's happening within the social media spaces, this sort of creativity and where it can live beyond the ads is making a big difference. And it's allowing athletes to connect with fans on a whole different level. And I think um, Ira said it earlier, it was your content for the athlete has to be legitimate. So when Tiger Woods puts out a tweet, we had to get it right for me so I could get it right for you, people buy into that. Because you know that on, on the course, Tiger is, is precise. Off the course, you know. But on the course, you know, he's precise. And if he's bringing out a shoe that's right for him, people are going to go out there and try and grab that shoe. And so when you have legitimate partnerships where the product works for the athlete and they tweet about it, that's when you start getting a lot of belief from fans. That's when people go out there and buy the product. So the social media space only really works, I think, because so many guys are doing it when the product is authentic to the athlete. And when that happens, you start to see things breaking beyond social media into the mainstream media. One of the questions someone asked earlier was, you know, the programming on ESPN. A lot of the times, programming was created at the television level and then spread elsewhere. What's happening now is programming come from anywhere. Because content gets fed through the web, it then feeds up. So no one really cared about John Isner. He's ranked like 113,000 in the world. But, but John Isner was in his 18th game in the fifth set and pretty much the longest game in tennis history. And he's tweeting about the fact that what's keeping him going is his Vita Coco. Suddenly that gets onto CNN. That comes from the social media space onto the traditional media space. And that's where you get part of making the news. When Josh Hamilton hit four home runs in one game and then you go to his... ESPN covers him in his house, he's got a fridge full of Vitacoco, and he says, the difference is I've been drinking Vitacoco, it makes the news. So when you have athletes, when you have celebrities, when Katy Perry, who basically says, I want a snack, I really want some indulgence, I don't want something too bad, on my rider when I'm performing in concerts around the world, I love pop chips, and she shows with a you know, fairly attractive new body there. I don't know what she's doing with John Mayer, but anyway, it's um, a separate story. Um, I'm doing an offline discussion on that. We'll do a tweet off about that. Um, but... It's believable. It fits. So when you have the right partner against the right brand, the creative that you develop goes much further, has a much longer shelf life, and you start creating disruption at a whole different level. It's what allows entrepreneurial brands in America to break through like nothing else. So just to wrap up in terms of the evolution of sports marketing, one is entrepreneurial deals are hot. People ask me, what do you look at? You know, I know the global world is very important, no doubt. But when you're an entrepreneurial brand in America, this is the greatest country in the world to start up a brand. Everyone else looks to us. We started here, and then everyone else, honestly, I think, copies products across the world. You see it here. So if you're to start an entrepreneurial brand, this is the greatest place to do that. And for athletes, everyone wants in for these entrepreneurial deals. Because if you put your money in the stock market, who knows where it's going. But you get into entrepreneurial companies early, and you're smart, you can make some money. And it's not just you guys in the room, but it's celebrities as well. And they all want skin in the game. Skin of the game and equity is what's changing the difference at the moment, and you guys are seeing it now more than ever before. Our parents' generation, they just want to get a job, sit in that job for 30 years, make enough money, put in the pension. You guys are all like, I want to start a new company. I want to buy into a company. I want to be an owner. 
People want skin in the game. It's not just you, but athletes and celebrities, the same thing. And social media is giving athletes a bigger footprint. You can have three or four baseball players, all the same, all amazing stars. But if one of them is tweeting more, has a bigger social media footprint, you probably will pick that guy to partner in your company versus the other three. And athletes realize that. Now, sometimes you can have a big footprint like our boy Ocho Cinco and maybe not be on the team. But it's, you know, it's better that you do both. You've got to perform on the field, but the social media footprint gives you something bigger. And athletes are using creativity to stand out. With YouTube, they can create their own ads. They can create their own content. If their tweets are funny, if their Facebook following posts are funny, they can start leveraging creativity to say, I'm here, here's my brand. Even if I have a helmet on, you know who I am. And finally, that makes a difference. The social media reach is really indicative these days of what marketers are looking for in high-performance athletes, high-performance celebrities, because it adds to the mix. So if you guys out there tomorrow want to go create a company, the summary of the presentation is have an original idea. Be passionate about it, what Steve Ross said earlier. Believe in yourself. Create an amazing culture. Partner with the right people, whether it's the one in ten or the celebrities and the influencers. And break through using creative disruption. Break through with ideas because people in this country look for that innovative product, look for that creative idea. We are the most creative nation on earth, and I think that this is where it starts. So have that entrepreneurial idea, have that creativity, and believe in yourself, and you guys will take off. Thank you very much. Sure. If you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Rosie can call on you. No. Really, no questions? Oh, okay. Down here on the left. So the app that you use in the uh, providing water were pretty big names, top of money. So how would you approach that situation if you were a smaller brand with fewer resources? Like Under Armour is a good example. You use pretty much no name athletes. Um, some of these athletes weren't big. Like David Wright was, you know, the, uh, the president of the company was a huge Mets fan, and David Wright wasn't a big star at the time. So we, got, we went to David early, local, and then he blew up and became you know, the darling of New York. Because some guys were a lot smaller and then took off. Others, like a Brian Earl, like was a big name. But I think that what we did was we changed the game by going with equity versus cash. The reason I did the deal with 50 is not that I was that smart. I just had no money. So I said, said I got, I, this is how much I've got. And he said, no problem. How much skin can I get? And we struck a deal that gave him you know, the equity piece, and suddenly... It changed the game. And so, you know, entrepreneurial companies are doing that a lot now. And if you people believe in the brand, you can be a small brand and still get a big name because they believe in the product and now they're owners within the product. I, my expense accounts are ridiculous. It's part of the problem. Um, I mean, these suits don't come cheap. Um, uh, I think a I, for me, a lot of the companies I've been involved in, we invest heavily in the early days of a company to build the brand. So whether it's Vitamin Water in the early days, whether it's you know, Pop Chips or Vitacoco, we, we build a brand because if you build a brand, you have longevity. It's here. Vitamin Water is going to be here for years to come. You know, Vitacoco, Pop Chips will be here for years to come. You invest in the brand. The, the overall margins, the top line, are fine. But if you invest a lot of money in marketing, then you reduce the bottom margins. But I think you have to do that because America is a branded culture. And if you build a brand in this country, you can always start reducing your marketing costs after a while. But you've got to invest in the early days. So the percentage, your dollars might increase, but the percentage of your revenue for marketing starts to reduce over time as you build the size of the brand. So uh, several things. One is I half joke about 50 shooting me. Uh, is I, I've taken a stance of not talking about what different athletes get in equity-wise because I think that's for that very reason. And I think it totally varies on the individual. Like Just like in sports, not everyone on the team is getting the paid the same salary. Different players have different roles to play. Some guys are bigger. Some guys are national. Some guys are regional. So each of these athletes has a market price that is sort of out there. And so you're going to have to work out how that market price then translates in the value of your company. 
and then the equity you give. So your company's worth 100 million bucks, and this guy usually gets a million bucks a year, maybe he gets you know, a point or half a point of the company as it grows. So you know, you use that benchmark in terms of giving the equity piece out. But you don't discuss it, because that's the worst scenario that happens. Up there. Oh, sorry, two up there. OK, I'll go with the lady first, then we'll go with you right up in the bleachers. I didn't see the bleachers. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> this is life, right? This is the problem. Um, Benjamin CEOs are watching. I think part of the problem is uh, some of the challenges is you know when when you did the vibe, not every uh, brand is the same blueprint. The fundamental dynamics that I talked about are similar, but then brands you know have different growth stages and some of the, some of the uh, pressures that I felt is I've tried to emulate the vitamin water growth trend with every brand and it doesn't work. You've got, you've got to spend differently, you've got to build differently, different categories uh, have to manage differently. So part of it is I've, I've been successful, but I sort of, one of the things that I've done consistently is I've partnered with very smart people. That's my consistent piece. And then challenge-wise, I've had to learn each industry. You saw my slide up there, it's a student of the industry. I've literally had to learn every industry to get a better understanding of how we build that brand because sort of one size doesn't fit all. So, you know, culturally, you want to create the same culture there. You want to hire smart people. But the way you market and build a brand will vary by industry. And so that's what I've, that's one of the challenges I've had, I've had to sort of deal with. The second thing is speed of imitators these, these days is much quicker than it was back in the day. Back in the day, you had much more time. Even when Vitamin Water came out, we had a few years before everybody started coming after us. You know, in, in Vitacoco or Pop Chips, people are coming out very rapidly right afterwards. So imitation is very rapid. They say it's the biggest form of flatter, flattery, which is true. It's also the biggest pain in the ass. So it's a combination factor there. Oh, sorry, up, up there. I forgot about you, man. Yeah, so you spoke a lot about building an establishing brand. Um, many of us probably won't want to start our company before we're established. So obviously, they need to innovate as well and, and control the market uh, to grow. How can we use a strategy to test these non options? There's obviously a risk of putting a very public face on the company. So I think that a lot of big corporations actually want to do the same thing. They want to have creative disruption. There's a lot of inertia in big corporations that prevent you from doing that. So my first point is, whatever brand you end up working on, be the brand messiah for that brand. Like, actually love the product you're working on. Because if you end up working on a product that just because you want to get a paycheck, I just don't think you'll be as creative on it because you're not living the brand. That's part one. Part two, I think... You have to take a risk sometimes. Now, it's difficult on a brand like Coca-Cola, that's the most iconic brand in the world, to take a risk on. It's tough to put a face on that. But on other brands, you can, and you sort of need to. Because if you don't take that risk, someone will come there and usurp you. Now, in beverages, it's, it's tougher to usurp someone because distribution is such a huge part of it. So it's difficult to become the next new soda. But in other areas, if you don't take that risk, even in a big corporation, your brand will start to slow down and disappear. You can't take too much risk to get fired like me. Do you ever like read Jen Shiva on one of your advertisers? <laughs> um, so it's a tough one because I, I know Robbie Tebow personally. So it's, uh, he's, Tebow's a great guy. I think that uh, he, what people love about Tebow is his authenticity as an individual as much as his playing skills. Like his play, in fact, his authenticity as a human being is actually greater than his playing skills. And I think that people love that genuineness about him that, you know, Bob talked about don't leave anything, you know, on, you know, on the field or leave everything on the field, basically. He leaves everything on the field. Like, you know he's given it his all. He's the sort of type of individual people emulate. They want their kids to be like a Tim Tebow. So would I use Tim in something? Absolutely. Because I think he defined that. Now, he's a great athlete. Like, you know, if you start benchmarking him against some others, you can start debating the numbers, but it's not like he hasn't performed. He hasn't won a Heisman Trophy. He hasn't won a college championship. You know, and maybe in the right environment in the, in, in the NFL, he could do really well. But I think he combines great brand awareness. People know exactly who he is. They know he's performed athletically. He's done, he did a great job with the Broncos last year. But he's the sort of guy that, that families across America want people to emulate. But he's not, he's not doing it in a cheesy way. So I would absolutely use Tim in, in some products. I send him all my products. One more question. Wow. Okay, right at the back. You have to shout it out.
See, I knew I should have gone with a simpler question. Um, I think it becomes tougher in a service-based service -based industry. Uh, I haven't had as much experience with it, and I suppose I'll, I'll give you the answer that I go with is I've learned with time. It's a good closing thing. Is I've learned with time that um, I'm not a jack of all trades, but I'm, I'm pretty good at a few. And I think that, you know, I've looked at a bunch of different industries, you know, service industry. <laughs> I got involved in real estate and I lost money. Um, pick something that you know. And so I'm not even going to be able to try and tackle that because I don't know it. If you pick something that you like and you're passionate about, I think you'll find ways to create disruption. You'll find ways to build your brand. But don't go into something just because they pay better. Uh, go into something because you love it. And, and, and the reason I think I've done fairly well in the fields that I'm in is it doesn't feel like work. I love working on the brands I'm involved in. And these ideas of creative disruption come naturally to me and the team I work with because we're all very passionate about it. So it can work in any industry. You just have to be passionate about that industry. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.